It is my joy to be with you all here this morning. As Reverend Whitney said, I am Canon D. Littlepage, and I serve as your Canon for Mission Advocacy, Racial Justice, and Reconciliation. And one of the joys of my ministry is getting to come to churches that I've never been to before. I've known Reverend Whitney since I came to the Diocese of Connecticut, but I've never had the chance to be here. And so I am very glad to join you this morning. This weekend, my dad is celebrating his 50th college graduation. And as he was talking about leading up to it, I began to reflect on the <clears throat> number of years that I've been out of college and watching my friends as our journeys have changed, particularly on social media. I've watched as our posts have changed from campus goings on. Gone are the days of posts about the angst of first jobs. Now, many of my friends post about the joys and challenges of being parents. I would not be able to count the number of posts that I've seen my friends make about taking the time and energy and how frustrating it is to try to do things differently from the way they were raised. For many of my friends, one way that manifests is them not saying, because I said so, when their kids say why. Apparently, the new age of parenting says that that does not honor a child's intellect, nor does it build relationship. Even though it may be frustrating and hard, saying because I said so is not the way to build that connection. I grew up in a because I said so house. <laughs> and when we look at today's gospel, I think many of us might have that in the back of our mind in today's gospel and the epistle reading. The relationship with God is one of following God's commandments because God said so? Well, yeah, God is God, but that's not the point of the readings today, I don't think. When we look at these readings, we might also hear that kind of childhood schoolyard, well, if you were really my friend, you would let me go first. If you were my friends, you'll do what I tell you to do. But that is not either the message that Jesus is saying to his disciples or to us this morning. This morning's gospel is an invitation for us to explore that relationship between obedience and love of God, and then why it matters for us to live into that love of God. Jesus said to his disciples, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. See, this statement of Jesus is not one saying, if you do this, then I'll do this. If you abide in my love and follow my commandments, then I'll abide with you. Instead, Jesus is being descriptive. It's simply a fact that loving God means following God's commandments. And Jesus tells us and has shown us over and over what that most important commandment is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. See, this following of God's commandments is not a trying to do a checklist to win God's love. Jesus is simply stating the fact, if you love God, then you will love others. And that is what it means to follow God's commandments and abide in his love. And we have to remember here the context in which Jesus is saying these words. This is as he gathers with his disciples before his crucifixion. This is after he has taken off his robe and washed their feet. Jesus has shown them already that his commandment to love is not some abstract thing, but is an embodied servant to being a servant to one another. This sermon on love that Jesus is giving his disciples is setting the stage for what is going to come. They are going to be traumatized when they see him arrested and crucified. They are going to have the work of building community ahead of them. And if they're going to do any of that, they need to be reminded and steeped in that foundation of that one commandment, love. In some ways, Jesus is preparing them and us to be able to, in the midst of the darkest of nights, in the midst of the most challenging of times, even if our voice shakes, whisper a cold and broken alleluia. In this time, we are still in Eastertide, and the first alleluias of Easter may have lost a little bit of their luster. 
As we move into Pentecost and the season after Pentecost, we have the long green season of ordinary time where not much is going on. But it's precisely at this time or in the times in our lives when our alleluias are strong and glorious that we prepare for those times when all we can muster is the cold and broken alleluia. It is in these times that we prepare ourselves through remembering and practicing those acts of love so that we can, with the world, say, even at the grave, we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. In this Easter season, it doesn't mean that our lives have all been Easter happy and glorious. There's a lot of pain in each one of our lives. As we continue to watch what's happening in Gaza, as we continue to hear stories of gun violence in our communities, as we continue to struggle with what it means to try to be connected in this world that is so disconnected, many of us perhaps find ourselves wondering what the point of Alleluia even is. It seems like a farce to raise our voices and say, praise God, Alleluia. But that's what Jesus is telling us this morning, that when we hold on to this love, we can indeed have a new relationship with what, with what it means to live as people of love. In the song, we hear the descriptions of what love is and is not, that love is not a victory march. How many of us have ever been in situations where it seems like the most important thing is to be right? I've never had that kind of thing. I've never insisted on being right, but maybe, maybe, maybe you have too. Maybe you've never, and I doubt you never, none of you have either, sorry. <laughs> Oftentimes, we get confused that love means winning, but love is not a victory march. Sometimes what we learn from love in this world, what we learn from love in the way that our society is set up, where there are winners and losers, is that you better get yours before somebody else does. Learn to outshoot somebody who outdrew you. Learn to be first. Learn that you have to look out for yourself because no one else will. But Jesus says, no, my friends. What it means to abide in my love is this. No greater love has anyone than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now, there is the question then of who are my friends? And I believe we could go back to that same question of who is my neighbor? And Jesus would tell us, Anyone we meet. Anyone we meet, we are obligated to show that love for. Now, Jesus is not saying that we should be willing to die for each and every person we encounter. But what does it mean for you and for me to lay down my life for those around me? Perhaps it means being willing to lay down those things that bring me comfort, to go beyond my comfort zone into somebody else's space and say, here I am to be in relationship with you. Perhaps laying down one's life means laying down the armor that we all wear and allowing ourselves to show ourselves really and truly to one another. Perhaps it means taking the risk of breaking a friendship in the service of telling the truth, of saying, you know, that really is not in line with my values and how I am called to live my life. Being willing to push back about rhetoric that dehumanizes others, that dismisses those as less than because of their nation of origin, their language, their class status. This, my friend, is what it means to lay down our lives, is to lay aside those things that we hold to so dearly to make us feel safe in order to feel the vulnerability that Jesus felt when Jesus came, loved us so much that he became human and gave his life for us on the cross. This is what it looks like to lay down one's life for one's friends, to be present for each other in times of threat and crisis. This world, my friends, is indeed in crisis, and we don't have to look very far to see it. But how are we supposed to respond to all of the hurt in this world? We can't, none of us can, but what we can do is in the interactions that we have, in those spheres of influence in which we live, we can live out this love that Jesus teaches us. And this all matters because Jesus says to us, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. 
This world is hungry, and they need the fruit that we bear from the vine of Jesus' love. This world is hungry, and they need us, the church, to be the church. They need us to be the people of love and hope. They need us to be the people that says, even though we disagree, we don't have to dehumanize each other. The world needs us to be the people that say, this world is worth our time and energy, and we will do everything we can to set our little world around us right, one step at a time. One of the prayers that I often go back to is from a book called The Book of Uncommon Prayers by Brian Doyle. And he has kind of prayer poems is how he writes them. And this prayer, the, the beginning of the poem is the title of the poem slash prayer. And it's furious prayer for the church I love. And this is my invitation, my prayer for you and for me as we continue to live into God's commandments and abide in God's love in order to be the church. Furious prayer for the church I love and have always loved, but which drives me insane with its thirst for control and power and money, rather than the one simple thing the founder insisted on. Granted, it's a tough assignment, the original assignment. I get that, love. Lord help us, could we not have been assigned something easier like astrophysics or quantum mechanics, but no, love. Love those you cannot love. Love those who are poor and broken and foul and dirty and sick with sores. Love those who wish to strike you on both cheeks. Love the blowhard, the pompous jerk, the arrogant liar. Find the Christ in each heart, even those. Preach the gospel and only if necessary, talk about it. Be the word. Bring love like a bright weapon against the dark. The rabbi did not say build churches or retreat houses or convene conferences or issue petition papers. He was pretty blunt about the hungry, the naked, and the sick. He was not reasonable. We forget this. The church is not a reasonable idea. The church should be a verb. When it is only a noun, it is not what the founder asked of us. Let us pray that we are ever after dissolving the formal arrogant thing that wants to rise and ever fomenting the contradictory, revolutionary, countercultural thing that could change life on this planet with love. It could, you know. So let's try again today. And so, amen.